So uh, th th thanks, Van San, for the for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers first for the opportunity to speak here. And of course, uh, we are all uh, a bit disappointed that we couldn't actually uh, make the trip to to Marseille. Um, so in particular, I'm, I'm looking at these slides, uh, the front page of this slide. I mean, there, there's a photo there, I guess, that I took uh, in 2016. Uh, I don't know if it appears to you in the right orientation, because on my slide, it looks like it's rotated 90 degrees. Uh, but when I download it onto my uh, laptop, it turns out the right way. Okay, so I don't know what is, uh, um, what is the type of technological issue uh, this is. Well, since, since we are not uh, able to, uh, to, to go to Marseille, I thought I, I, I start by sharing uh, some photographs from the last conference. Again, on, on, my, uh, on, my, on my screen, it shows that the, some, some of the photographs are upside down. Um, I don't know if that is how it appeared to you uh, as well. Okay. Um, anyhow, uh, maybe uh, you see going from this, this photo here, this is a photo of uh, myself with uh, Josh Lansky who uh, we are graduate students together. And uh, actually, before we met in, that conf in uh, 2016, uh, I had not seen him for more than 10 years. So I was, uh, was very happy to see him and take a hike with him uh, five years ago. Uh, this upside down photo here is, uh, I guess it's in the lounge at uh, Lumini. Um, I don't know if you can recognize the people, but I guess there's uh, Nadia Gerevich, uh, Tasho Kaleta, uh, Di Hua Jiang, uh, Hang Xue and uh, Bing Shi and his wife, I guess. Okay, and then there are these other, uh, last one here is uh, of uh, Jeff Hakim and uh, Fiona Menahan uh, relaxing in the, in the water. So, okay, um, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we get a chance to relieve a bit, for those of us who were there at least, uh, the nice memories from 2016. Okay. And uh, I, I have to say curiously, when I look at the photo, that I, I, there were no evidence at all that a, a math conference had actually taken place uh, at that time. So it looks like a, you know, looks like some travel uh, publication photos. Okay, but anyhow, since today it is not, uh, you know, we're not here for a travel promotion talk. So let's uh, get down to the, uh, to the mathematics. Okay. Um, so let me first set up uh, some uh, notations. It's pretty standard notation. So I work with a periodic view. I consider a symplectic vector space W and uh, odd dimensional quadratic space. And uh, once you fix the dimension and the discriminant, there are two such quadratic spaces, uh, which are called them V plus and V minus. Maybe V plus is split, for example. Then it, once we have this pair of spaces, we have uh, what is called a dual pair, SP, W cross OV. Um, and because V has odd dimension uh, for the sake of doing uh, the how duality correspondence, um, I need to work with the metaplectic group, and, uh, which I'll just take to be the two-fold cover. Uh, as opposed to what one way did uh, in the first day of the conference. Uh, okay, then uh, once we have this dual pair, we have what is called a Bay representation for the dual pair, which depends on the additive character of the underlying few. And uh, then for representation pi of OV, we can define a smooth representation of MPW called the big data lift. Okay, it's defined as such. And of course, you can. Uh, go the other way, you could start with uh, pi tilde, a representation of MPW, and define its big data leaf, data pi tilde on OV. Then the basic result uh, in this uh, subject is so-called how duality uh, theorem, uh, first proved by Hao himself and Walsh Berger, and then uh, completed by, in my work with uh, Takeda and uh, uh, Bing Yong Sun. And it says that this big data leaf, if it is not zero, has finite length, with a unique irreducible quotient. And moreover, if pi one and pi two are different, then they are, these unique irreducible quotients are also different. Okay. Moving ahead. So I will focus in this talk on the equal rank case, which is the case when m equals to n. So dimension of v is 2n plus one, dimension of w is 2n. Uh, in this special case, uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, how duality correspondence is quite well understood. Uh, in particular, we have the following theorem called the local Shimura correspondence, which was proved um, with Gordon Savin uh, perhaps 10 years ago. So if we consider the data correspondence between MPW and uh, OV, so there are two Vs, right? V plus and V minus. So uh, we can consider the data leaf to either of them. 
And then you can compose that with the restriction from OV to SOV. Well, OV is a direct product of SOV with plus minus one. So this restriction is quite harmless. Um, and in doing so, you actually get a bijection between the irreducible. And here, uh, when I look at representations of MPW, I always look at the genuine ones. In other words, those that uh, do not factor through SPW. Okay. You get a bijection between the irreducible genuine representations of MPW with the disjoint union of the irreducible representation of SOV plus and SOV minus. And this is a nice projection. It carries discrete series to discrete series. It also carries tempered representations to tempered representations. So you have a, in this bijection, you can insert the subscript tempered. Okay. Uh, so I've told you what uh, this how duality correspondence and vague representations are. So now uh, just quickly run through uh, the notion of characters. So if you have an irreducible representation of a uh, p group GF, uh, you can consider its Harris Chandra character, which is defined, which is a conjugacy invariant distribution on GF. Um, taking, uh, if you give me an input uh, function F, which is completely supported and smooth, um, it throws out the number, which is trace of pi F, okay? So here you see, I'm just taking the sum of diagonal matrix coefficients of pi F. So it is a it's a distribution which is conjugacy invariant. In other words, it factors through this uh, quotient by the uh, um, you know the, the, the co-invariant space by the uh, the diagonally embedded GF. So acting by conjugation. Uh, so the main point I want to remark here or to recall here is that if pi is tempered, this distribution extends to a, a, a larger space of functions, namely the Harris Chandra sort space. Which uh, you know, which which is larger than C C infinity, and but it's still contained in L two. Okay, so here's the main question I want to discuss, uh, at least in the first uh, two thirds of this um, of this talk. Oh, sorry. Um, well, namely, suppose that uh, pi and pi tilde uh, correspond under this local Shimura correspondence, this bijection that we had earlier. Uh, then um, I'd like to ask, how are their Harris Chandra characters uh, related? Okay. Oops. Yeah. And this question has been uh, actually studied for the past 30 years by uh, Thomas Preshpinda. Uh, though he focused on the case when the underlying field is, is the field of real numbers. Okay? Uh, what he did was he introduced a construction uh, which he called the cauchy harris chandra integral. Okay? And this, uh, con this integral has the, uh, it does the following for you. It transfers a invariant distribution from one group to, a, to another, from one member of the dual pair to, to the other member. Okay? And uh, moreover, it carries uh, eigen distribution to eigen distribution. So with respect to the center of universal enveloping algebra. And he conjectured that this construction actually carries the characters of a representation pi to the character of theta pi. And um, so the construction is well defined, but, uh, but he could only verify his conjecture uh, when the dual pairs are in the so-called stable range, which means one group is much larger than the other group. You are lifting from a smaller group to a much larger group. Um, of course, this was this is not the case I'm considering today. Today, I'm considering the so-called equal rank case. Um, so in that context, in fact, there's a recent paper by Alan Marino uh, that verified uh, Breshbinder's conjecture in the equal rank case for UN cross UN dual pair. Uh, he verified for the discrete series uh, representations. You can find his paper on the archive that it appeared just a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so Alan was a postdoc in, uh, in, in NUS in Singapore uh, for the last three years, I guess, but he's, he, in April, he just moved on to, uh, I think, Ottawa. So in any case, um, there were this work uh, from Prashpinda and his collaborators, and um, it is very analytic in nature, and, and somehow the analytic difficulties is sort of perhaps a, a main obstacle in, in in actually verifying his conjecture. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is to propose a, 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 a con 
slightly more conceptual approach, okay, which you will see will be very, uh, very, very clean. Um, so as, uh, to summarize, so the approach will be uh, as follows. So first we, are, we, we are going to compare uh, two characters, right? characters of pi and characters of pi tilde. So these are invariant, conjugacy invariant distributions on different groups. And uh, so uh, they are linear functionals on different uh, domains, right? So in order to compare them, you need to compare the, their domains. So um, we are going to introduce certain spaces of test functions um, for the two groups, MPW and SOV. So this will be the domain for the, um, so you can imagine these functions could be like CC infinity of the group, okay? A, a domain uh, on which the Harris Chandra character is defined. We're going to then uh, introduce a notion of transfer between these spaces of test functions and show that this transfer actually, uh, you know, transfer is not a map, right? It's kind of a correspondence. It's a like, one-to-many uh, type of map. But if you descend to the level of orbital integrals, okay, which uh, for me is just this co-invariant space, like uh, when I mentioned the previous slide, um, when one descends to that level, you actually get a well-defined map. And in fact, in this, uh, context of the equal rank case that I'm considering, you get an isomorphism. Uh, now, once you have this, uh, you can pull back invariant distribution from one group to another. Uh, once you have this well-defined map on the level of uh, these co-invariant spaces. And then uh, we're going to see that indeed you will carry uh, the character of pi to the character of pi tilde. And then uh, you will see the definition of a transfer is very, very simple. Uh, is not really geometric in nature. So in the end, I will discuss uh, a geometric description of this transfer map, uh, where I will make use of the moment map that arise in the beta correspondence. Okay. Okay, so here's the space of test functions. Very easy to describe just on this slide. Um, so we have the very representation. So we fix our dual pair, uh, MPW and uh, SOV, either V plus or V minus. So I, I guess I call it V epsilon here. Epsilon is plus or minus. So I take uh, this omega tensor itself, I mean, with a complex conjugate, so I doubled it, okay? And then I'm going to define uh, maps P and Qs uh, to spaces of functions on MPW and SOV, respectively. And what are these two maps? They're just defined by matrix coefficients, okay? You give me a, you know, some, some, a pure tensor in this tensor product, phi one tensor phi two, I just look at the matrix coefficients, okay? Of course, these are smooth functions on the groups, and I'm going to set S, and my space of test function will be the image of these maps, P's and Q's. Um, we can also describe it uh, slightly differently, uh, namely, the, this tensor product, which I call capital omega, uh, it can be very naturally realized as a space of a Swartz function on V tensor W. Okay, so, so it is a very concrete space. You can, you can choose this concrete realization, just functions of V tensor W. Uh, and then in this uh, incarnation, the maps P and Q are defined as follows. So P phi, a function on MPW, evaluated at G uh, is just a G comma one ev acting on phi and then evaluated as zero. Uh, so what, what is G comma one? Well, so, so what group acts on this tensor product? Well, um, let's call my group G and H, okay? So on the little omega, you have G cross H, right? So since you doubled it, you have now G cross H cross G cross H. So in particular, you have G cross G acting. And uh, so when I write this, uh, this pair G comma one, I mean, I'm thinking of it as an element in G cross G. Okay, so likewise over here, I have an element H comma one in H cross H. Okay, so you could, uh, here's a, this, so this is another way of describing this uh, two projection maps, uh, P and Q. Okay, uh, so, well, what do we know about this space uh, of test functions, which is the image of the maps, P's and Q's? Uh, so the first lemma says that, uh, in fact, this map, this function is squeezed, this space of function is squeezed between the CC infinity and the uh, Harish Chandra Swartz space. Okay. In fact, um, uh, so I guess I just state this lemma for Q's, you have a corresponding one for P's. So the map Q, um, this subjective map, right? it actually factors through to give an isomorphism of uh, the MPW diagonal co-invariance uh, of, of big omega. Okay. And a corollary of this is that, um, you know, if you have a tempered representation, 
and you have now a function you have a function f in this space of test function that we have just defined then pi f makes sense and trace of pi f makes sense okay the reason is just because f lies in a heavy chandra sort space and pi is tempered um, okay so now we can uh, define transfer okay we will say that two uh, functions uh, f and f tilde are transfer of each other if you can find a phi in capital omega that uh, that maps to both of them. So P5 equals to F and Q5 equals to F, uh, F tilde. Okay, so notice that, you know, there was this epsilon here because there were these two quadratic space, V plus and V minus, right? So uh, in fact, um, so it's quite annoying to carry this epsilon around. So you can put them together, so to speak. I mean, you just define this space as the direct sum, okay? And then um, you can define, the, you know, you, similarly, you have this uh, direct sum of the two uh, spaces of functions on MPW, which are, uh, you know, which are, which you constructed using uh, the two cases plus minus. Okay, of course, there's some uh, comment to make here, which is that S plus MPW and S plus S minus, sorry, MPW, they are both subspaces of smooth functions of MPW. And uh, of course, you could have taken the, the exterior direct sum, but, but, uh, but in fact, they are, um, I mean, the you know, the, their, their sum is direct in, in the space of smooth functions of MPW. I mean, that requires proof, but, uh, but I'm not going to go into that here. Okay. So, so this is just saying that we can uh, put the plus and minus space together. Okay. And uh, henceforth, I'm going to do that so that I don't have to carry this epsilon uh, float or signs floating around. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so now I'm going to, uh, I have defined a correspondence, right? It's not a function. It's just a, uh, uh, correspondence between two spaces of functions. Um, but you can refine that to a map, okay? And here's how you can do it. So you start with this uh, omega, which is a direct sum of omega plus and omega minus, right? You have this map, which I guess this is a map P, mapping to uh, a test function of MPW. I compose that map with the projection to this co-invariant space, okay? Then of course, this composite map is MPW diagonal invariant, and hence it has to factor through the MPW diagonal co-invariance of omega. But we have noted in the, I guess the lemma on the previous page that this, this co-invariance space is just my space of a test function on SOV, okay? So you, you get, so it factors to a map. So this is actually a map now, not a correspondence. Uh, moreover, of course, this last arrow, this arrow here is also SOV diagonal invariance. So so it further descends to give a map from this co-invariant space to that one. Okay, and this, and of course you could have done this using the map Q instead of P going the other way. You're going to get a map going the other way and this, the composite of those two will be identity. Okay, so in fact this map would be isomorphism. Okay, so and that's what this lemma uh, records for me, that this construction gives an isomorphism. I mean, I call these uh, spaces of orbital integrals. Of course, uh, you know, when you think of orbital integrals, you think of doing some integration uh, on some functions, right? But of course, this, this is somehow the, the abstract uh, uh, incarnation of uh, orbital integrals, okay? Because any invariant distribution will factor through uh, this, this quotient. Okay, so now uh, with the previous lemma, we, we can now transfer invariant distribution between the two spaces. Okay? And uh, uh, the main theorem, I guess, is, the, is this one, which says that if you start with pi and it's data leave uh, under the local Shimura correspondence, it corresponds to pi tilde on MPW. Uh, you know, uh, assume pi is tempered, so pi tilde is also tempered. Uh, then, uh, you know, the pullback of beta pi is beta pi tilde. Okay, so in fact, um, you know, this theorem was actually uh, first shown by Hang Xue okay, in his uh, Duke paper, which was devoted to uh, uh, an uh, arithmetic version of the gross Brassard conjecture. Okay. And um, he actually, he showed this, but not phrased in the same way. Okay. Rather, he showed this identity as an identity between two doubling zeta integrals. So doubling zeta integral is something that comes up in a... Um, well, it's a ranking sample integral that represents the standard L function, right? So, so he somehow uh, needs to relate um, doubling zeta integral, one on SOV, one on MPW, and he proved this identity, okay? 
uh, in the in that language, so to speak. So um, you might say, so what what is the uh, so in some sense this identity is is, is known, and what is uh, uh, new here, I guess, is the whole um, the framework. I mean, this whole framework of interpreting this result. Okay. So what I want to do in the rest uh, of this talk is to first I will give a sketch proof of the character identity. It's quite short. My sketch will be just two slides. And then I'm going to give a geometric description of the transfer of test functions. Because so far we have a very clean definition, but for example, we don't have a formula. Okay. And we can ask if, if, if it's possible to give a formula. Okay, so here's the sketch proof. So let me take a function phi in this uh, capital omega. And uh, I recall that uh, the maps P phi and Q phi are uh, defined by, you know, P phi of G is, you know, G comma one acting on phi evaluating as zero. Okay, but if I take G to be one, then it, I just get phi zero. Likewise for Q phi. Okay, so I have these two. Okay, on the other hand, P phi lies in the harris chandra Schwartz space. So I can apply the harris chandra puncturel theorem, uh, which was actually uh, proved in Wasperger's uh, paper. Uh, it gives a spectral decomposition of the uh, direct delta distribution on the space of uh, harris chandra uh, Schwartz functions, right? So P501 has a spectral uh, decomposition and the terms, you know, so here the measure is just the harris chandra puncturel the puncturial measure. And, and what appears here, the term corresponding to each pi tilde is the Harris Chandra character. Likewise, you can do it for Q phi. Now, of course, this puncturial measure depends on the choice of Ha measure on the groups, okay? So um, at the moment, we can pick those Ha measures on the two groups independently. Uh, but of course, we're not going to do that in the moment. Um, so. So what we have shown then is we have this identity, so I, which I just copied from the previous slide. Okay. Because this left-hand side is the spectral expansion of P phi one, the right-hand side is the spectral expansion of P, uh, Q phi one. Okay. And now we want to uh, compare them, right? Now it's not convenient because the domain of integration are over the unitary dual of these two uh, different groups, two different spaces. But we have the local Shimura correspondence that allows us to, uh, you know, to say that this is bijection between the tempered unitary dual. Um, that'll be enough for us because um, the puncturel measure is supported on the tempered, uh, on the tempered unitary dual, okay? And uh, a, a result of mine with uh, Ichino uh, says that uh, if you choose the Haar measure on the two groups uh, appropriately, then uh, when you use this local Shimura correspondence and you push forward the uh, uh, Planck measure from one side to the other, uh, you know, you, you get the Planck measure on the other side. Okay. So let's assume we normalize, we choose our hard measure so that, you know, this identity holds. Then, then what uh, it does is that it, it allows us to pull back one side of this identity so that, um, so for example, I'm pulling back from MP to SO side. So that now uh, I get the both sides are, you know, involved integration over the same space. And now you see that this is already very close to the identity we want. Okay, you have an integral of the character equals the integral of the character. Or what you need to do is to, you want to delete this uh, integration sign. And uh, I guess that's a way of doing that uh, by using a Bernstein center argument. Okay, so that's uh, uh, my rough sketch, of the proof. And you can see the proof is not so hard. Um, just use the puncturel theorem, right? And, uh, and, and the fact that, uh, you know, how the puncture measure behaves under data correspondence. Okay, so, um, so at this point, let me take a pause because it, it um, so it looks to me that uh, we have a rather simple but rather compelling picture, okay? And then you can ask like, so what is happening here? I mean, like, what, is there any content to this? Is this just some sort of very formal thing? Uh, or not. Okay, so in the next slide, I'm going to explain. Uh, um, I'm going to spend some time on the next slide because it um, the formal setup, so to speak. I, I want to understand sort of why why are things so simple, and I mean, like, what which part of it is? So what is the meat? I guess. Okay. So to explain this, uh, so let me start with the following initial data. I'm taking. Uh, a very simple initial data. I have a pair of groups, G cross H could be anything. I take a representation omega of G cross H, uh, not the very representation, any, any representation, okay? And suppose this has a 
irreducible quotient, pi tensor sigma. And let me assume pi and sigma are unitary. Okay, that's all. I start with a completely uh, arbitrary abstract setting like that. Okay. Because you, you don't expect that you can get a lot out of, out of just such an initial data. I mean, like, it's so uh, random somehow. Uh, but in fact, um, I'm going to construct a large commutative diagram just starting from this data. Okay. And uh, it is the following, uh, I guess, diamond shaped uh, hexagonal um, commutative diagram. So let me explain uh, what is happening. Okay. So remembering that this uh, is my only initial data. So first, uh, from the top, I have doubled my uh, omega, right? I look at omega tensor omega bar, the complex conjugate. I call it big omega. So, so I can double this map data. I look at data tensor data bar. And, and where should it go to? It should go to pi tensor sigma, tensor pi bar, tensor sigma bar, right? But because pi and sigma are unitary, uh, pi bar is isomorphic to the pi contragradient, okay? So I can think of pi bar as pi contragradient. Then I have pi tensor pi contragradient, which I can think of as basically endomorphisms of pi. In fact, uh, because you're looking at algebraic tensor product, it's just the finite ranked uh, linear maps, um, operators, linear operators on pi. Okay, so that's why I write it in this way. Okay, so that explains this first part. And now this, uh, this, this diamond here, this rhombus, uh, is just, uh, you know, you have, you have a pair of endomorphisms and you can take trace. They are finite ranked, so you can take trace. And you can take tr first the trace of the endomorphism of sigma, Right? And then you then take the endomorphism for pi, or you can do it the other way, and obviously it commutes. Okay, so you have a commutative diamond here. Okay, now uh, let's explain what the other two uh, parallelograms are. Okay, so let's, uh, I mean, th th this situation is completely symmetrical, so I'll just explain this side. So let's look at this composite from data tensor data bar, followed by taking trace on uh, endomorphism of sigma. Um, now, taking, tr so sigma is a representation of a uh, H, okay, so for example, here sigma is a reserved H. So endomorphism of sigma uh, is a rep, you know, is, is a representation of H cross H, okay, because it is just sigma tensor sigma contragradient, right? So it has an action of H cross H. When I take trace, uh, this linear functional is um, diagonal H invariant, okay? So this composite map is G cross G equivariant, uh, with G cross G egg on the target. But, and it is a uh, diagonal H invariant. Hence, it has to factor through the diagonal H invariant, uh, co-invariant space of omega. Right? So it's by, uh, I guess, by abstract nonsense, okay? So it has to factor through this. In other words, uh, there will be some, uh, you know, this explains this other branch of this uh, commutative diagram here. And likewise for the other side. Okay. So now for some obscure reason, instead of uh, writing capital omega, you know, with a subscript H uh, diagonal to, to denote the co-invariant space, let me for some reason call it SG, okay? And similarly, let me call this other side SH, okay? Uh, well, whatever this is, it is a representation of G cross G, okay? And this, uh, so this map P theta pi is G cross G equivariant. Okay, so I have obtained this uh, commutative diagram starting from essentially nothing. Okay, I have this uh, very, very innocuous looking initial data and I construct this. Okay, and, but, and the point to observe is that if you just look at this map P's and Q's, and, and, and you know, if, since we had, uh, we had called this SG and SH, it looks like this correspondence diagram that we have at the beginning. Right? Uh, so this notation is chosen to, to, uh, to, to, to suggest to us that maybe this covariant space is just some function, space of functions on G. Okay. Now, if it is, then, is, then this map is, you know, so pi is a representation of G. So when you have a representation of G, you know that the CC infinity of G will act on pi, right? So this map uh, perhaps is something like that, okay? And, and then you, if you, if this interpretation holds, then, then in fact, this, when you look at the outer, the outer um, circumference of this hexagon, you get a commutative diagram, right? The composite of this three arrow is the composite of this three arrow. And this is, you know, this is our character identity. Okay. So what is the contents of uh, all of this? 
it, it comes down to the following. So, um, you know, you have to answer the following two questions. So firstly, can this co-invariant space really be realized as a space of functions on G? I suppose the answer is yes. Then you can ask the next question. Is this map a uh, P beta pi, this map, uh, okay, uh, just the integrated version of pi? And somehow the whole meat lies in answering this question. Okay. You see, you, you, in, in general, the answer to this question should be no, right? Because you know, you're starting with rather random initial data. So why should you expect the answer to be yes? Okay. So for example, you could have started with a representation omega for which uh, the dimension of such maps to pi tensor sigma is, for example, 10 dimensional. So you have data one, 10 linearly independent maps, data one to data 10. Okay. For every one of these, you can construct this diagram, you get a map here. So you're going to get like 10 you know, dimension space of maps from, from SG to pi tensor pi check. Okay? Uh, now, that means that SG, for example, cannot be CC infinity of G because you know that for CC infinity of G, the maximum uh, pi tensor pi check isotopic quotient is uh, you know, just pi tensor pi check without multiplicity. So, you know, so for this to have a chance of like being close to CC infinity of G, um, you should not have a large dimensional space of such maps. Maybe for every pi tensor sigma, you should have one dimension space. Okay. Uh, in, in fact, you, by the same argument, you see that it is not good to have, uh, to be able to construct such projections map to pi tensor sigma one and pi tensor sigma two, because that is going to produce two sort of linearly independent maps here. So for the, for there to be a, to have a chance right, to, for this question to have uh, affirmative answers, you pretty much have to start with a situation where the how duality theorem holds. Okay. Okay. So, and that's where we put ourselves at the beginning, right? We put ourselves in this setting. And, and then uh, after that, we, you know, st we still need to answer these questions. And the point is that from the theory of how duality uh, correspondence, we can say that the answer to these two questions are yes, okay, at least in the equal rank setting that I've been discussing. And so, so in fact, that is the meat of, uh, of the whole uh, thing. Okay, I, I mean, uh, sorry, I, I don't know if this uh, uh, elucidate anything for anyone, but uh, uh, for me, it was, um, uh, it is good for me to isolate out the purely formal aspects, I guess, because the whole thing looks extremely clean to, to, to me. Okay, so I guess now I want to come to the next part, which is to give a geometric description of transfer in, uh, using the moment map. Okay, so what is the moment map? Um, the moment map in the context of data correspondence is the following double vibration. Uh, you have uh, V tensor W. So that is actually a symplectic a space, right? So it's a symplectic variety uh, equipped with a group action OB cross SPW. So there is a, it's a Hamiltonian action, there is a moment map. So the moment map, uh, so is, I write as this double vibration from P prime to Q prime. Um, do the dually algebra of SPW and the dually algebra of uh, SOV. Okay, the map is just defined in a uh, following way. So you give me T. So I can think of T as a linear map from V to W or W to V because uh, V and W have non-degenerate bilinear forms. So they can be identified with the dual, uh, the dual space quite naturally. And uh, then, uh, so every T, I think, for example, if I think of T as a linear map from V to W, I have this adjoint map P star from W to V. So I can then compose, uh, you know, T with T star, that will be a map from V to V, okay? And uh, it turns out that it is, uh, uh, you know, it has some uh, symmetries in it, okay? So that's how these maps are defined. Um, Okay, and uh, the properties are the, as follows. For example, let's just look at P prime, right? P prime is SPW equivariant, where SPW act on the target by the co-adjoint action. And it is SOV invariant, which is not surprising because uh, you know, there's no SOV action on the target. Okay. Um, and once you have this diagram, it induces a correspondence of orbits of uh, basically conjugacy classes from one side to the other. And if you restrict to the, so the analog of the regular semi-simple set, which are, which are the maximally non-degenerate maps, uh, then you actually get a bijection. But because we are in the, this equal rank setting. Okay? 
Now, so okay, so we are just repeating this uh, moment map diagram. Um, so this is on the level of spaces, but you can get a, you know, a, induce a diagram on the level of functions. Okay, so uh, for example, I, I, I look at CC infinity function on here, and, uh, and I can just integrate along fibers. By integrating along fibers, I get a map, and I get some functions here. Okay, I don't know, I just call it S or whatever. Okay, and uh, so now I have this diagram which sort of defines a moment map correspondence of these two spaces of functions. Okay, now so this already looks very similar to the correspondence diagram we have earlier, right? The only uh, difference is that, I mean, firstly, the domain, the, you know, the guy up here is the same space, okay? CC infinity of V tensor W. But down here, you have functions on the, some open set in the Lie algebra, okay? As opposed to uh, functions on the group, like just now. So if you want to relate these two, uh, you have to sort of uh, relate the targets. You have functions on group and function on the algebra. So maybe it's natural for you to think that let's use the exponential map to, to relate them. Okay. Uh, but of course, exponential map sort of only uh, is sort of behaves well in a small neighborhood of identity. Whereas, you know, these test functions here are like, they, they are quite somewhat global in nature, right? So, uh, so how do you, so you don't really want to use the exponential map to relate them. Uh, instead, it's better to use this uh, so-called Cayley transform. Because Cayley transform is kind of like the, the exponential map, but it is essentially a birational type of map. It is defined on a Zariski open set, so to speak. Okay. So the point is that you know, we have our space of test functions from before. We have this new one that um, you know, arises in this moment map story. And there is an isomorphism of MPW diagonal module. Um, I guess I call it J. Okay, this map is called J. So you give me a function f on the group. So jf is supposed to be a function on the Lie algebra. Its value at x is, is like that, okay? So where c is basically the KD transform. Uh, but there's an extra weight factor here, okay? Because, you know, this is a map to the MPW. So I, what I've written here is, is the projection of c to SPW, where it is given by the usual uh, KD transform. Okay, and I want to say this Cayley transform arises uh, very naturally. I mean, it's not sort of, you know, it's not like you try to do exponential map and it doesn't work well, so you try to look for something else. Uh, because as I explained earlier, the character identity that we are proving, uh, you know, it can be viewed through the lens of the doubling zeta integrals. Okay, now if you view things from those from that lens, right, you, you will see that um, you know, you are led to consider this doubling construction in data correspondence. So in the doubling construction, for example, right, so let's say we have our sp2n here. You doubled it, you consider sp4n. And uh, then you consider, uh, you know, the Ziegler parabolic for sp4n, call it p. So you have the partial flat variety sp4n mod p. Right? This is the setting for this doubling thing. And, in, and the point about this uh, partial flat variety is that uh, sp2n sits inside it as an open dense set. Okay. This, this is the geometry underlying the doubling zeta integral. But of course, uh, sp4n mod p, uh, it have many, have many open dense sets. For example, you can take n bar, right, the, the opposite unipotent radical. Right? That also gives you an open dense set in sp4n mod p. Okay? So you have two open dense sets. One is sp2n, one is this n bar. But what is this n bar? n bar is this... Uh, unipotent radical, right, for Ziegler parabolic on sp4n. So it's 2n by 2n symmetric matrices. In other words, it is the Lie algebra of sp2n. Okay, so in other words, in this partial variety, you have two open dense set. One is the group, one is this Lie algebra. Those two open dense set has to intersect in an open dense set. And uh, if you take a point in that intersection, it's like, you know, you have two coordinate patches. I mean, it has the coordinates in terms of the groups and coordinates in terms of the Lie algebra. And when you ask what is the relation, it is the Cayley transform. Okay, so that's how uh, the, it is, uh, um, you know, this is how one is led to this lemma, right? It is uh, saying that I have my function f, which is a function on the group. It is a smooth function, so it, it's okay if I restrict it to an open dense set, right? Let's say the intersection with this Lie algebra, and then I just rewrite it in this other coordinate system. That's what goes into the proof of this lemma. Okay, so there's this uh, weight factor here, and I want to point out here uh, just quickly that this weight factor has a meaning, okay? I mean, it's very explicit. It is determinant one minus 
the element to the dim you know, dimension v over two. In fact, it is the character of the Bay representation. Um, so there's a very nice paper of Taluji Thomas that describes the character of the Bay representation uh, by an explicit formula like that, which when you specialize to our element G tensor identity of V, so G is an MPW, uh, you know, it produces this, this vector, okay? So, so what I had on the other slide I had uh, was, uh, was a semi-true, right? Because I, I had oppressed some of these uh, delicate things like the Bay constants here, okay? So I, what I want to say was like, well, when you pass your, your test function from groups to Lie algebra, what you did was you are essentially pulling back by Cayley transform, but you have to weight it by the character of the Bay representation. Okay, so now we can relate the two, and this is a proposition. So uh, let's not read this, okay? Just look at this diagram, because you see the, the point was to relate P. Uh, so this was the map, we have, in the correspondence diagram, I have two maps, P's and Q's, right? So I'm trying to relate the P's in my diagram to the P's in the moment map, okay? So uh, let's just look at this diagram. This diagram, this commutative diagram expresses this equality, okay? So I have my map P, okay? That takes me to functions on MPW. Now, uh, I use this J, this isomorphism earlier to move the function to the Lie algebra. And I'm trying to describe this in another way. That's all, okay? Use, using this moment map. And so this other way is, first I do a Fourier transform on, the, on this vector space. Then I apply the moment map uh, P, okay, P mom. I get the function here. And then I do a Fourier transform. Of course, here this Fourier transform is in the sense of distribution, okay? And then I get a commutative diagram. Okay, so I, I guess uh, I have relate P and P star, for example. And of course, I have a similar uh, result for Q. And so when you put them together, you, you basically get the following descript geometric description. Uh, so if you have F tilde and F, two test functions which are in, co uh, in correspondence. So, so I want to say, describe how, when they are in correspondence. So, so first I move them to the Lie algebra, okay? And then I take their Fourier transform. Okay, so Fourier transform of J, F tilde, and and if those two correspond under the moment map correspondence, there's if and only if F tilde and F correspond under my original uh, correspondence. So you can, so maybe a sh one sentence way of saying this is that the correspondence we define is the Fourier transform of the moment map correspondence. Okay, so, uh, so that's finished up my geometric description. Uh, so it is geometric in the sense that it, you know, I relate it to this moment map correspondence, which I view is uh, something which is geometric in nature. But, uh, but of course you may ask, can I write out a formula? Like if I give you this orbital integral on MPW, can I write down the, you know, the output on the other side? Is, and what is this map? Is it given by some sort of analog of you know, some integ integral transform? Yes. Can I ask a question on the previous slide? Yes. Uh, did you define the, sh uh, is it the short space of the, the algebra? Is it uh, no, so so this uh, so so this uh, space uh, S of say S P W uh, with the heart, right? Is, is it the so, transform of the previous? Yeah, so so the the heart is maybe you don't need this page. Uh, yeah, you define the short space. Yeah, so 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 this uh, space this is an open dense set in the S in the Lie algebra, something like regular semi simple elements, right? And when I, when I do the moment integration along fibers, I get some functions on here. Mm -hmm. I, I want to think of them as distribution. Okay, they, they are, you can integrate them against a compactly supported function on the Lie algebra SPW. Mm -hmm. so, so here I'm doing a Fourier transform. Okay. Okay. And uh, let me see, uh, you're asking why there's no uh, heart here. So this is just the image. Yeah. Uh, let me think for one second. Um, sorry, I guess uh, this JW, the target, it could be just that I, I, uh, I forgot to put in the hearts. Okay. Um, because I, I did say something here. Ah, okay, I see. Uh, it, yeah, I, I guess you're right. I think uh, I, uh, up here there are two spaces of functions. So, so there's isomorphism taking it to some space of functions here, which I did not explicate, okay? And 
But on the other you... hand, by integration along fibers, I also have another. Yeah, so actually these two are different. I probably should delete the heart on the other one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, coming back here. Um, but, okay. hey, sorry, did I, uh, did I overshot? Maybe I overshot. Yes. So there's this isomorphism J. Maybe there's delete heart from here. Okay. It's an isomorphism onto some space of function on SPW. Okay. And it's given by this formula. So it's mm -hmm. whatever functions I get in this way. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, on the other hand, I have this S of SPW hard, right? Which is obtained by integration along fibers. Yes. And I, I only want to look at the, you know, the fibers over this open dense set. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's why here, uh, this J, there's, there's no hard here. And then one of the things that is claimed here is that these two spaces are carried to each other by Fourier transform. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I guess uh, I was talking earlier about, you know, can I write down formulas? And, uh, you know, I, I, I tried for some time, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, of course, I hope that by writing down formulas, we see the so called Cauchy Harris Chandra integral appear. Okay. But I haven't been able to do that yet. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to uh, uh, come to uh, a related theme, which is uh, about periods, okay? Because the, uh, the technique for deriving this character identity actually can be applied in the setting of the relative Langlands program to derive relative character identities, okay? In fact, what we did, right, was uh, we, we used data correspondence to relate the following two symmetric space. So these are the group cases, okay? But but data correspondence can relate other periods. So for example, you could have a period P on G and a period Q on H. Uh, and I say that they are related by data correspondence means, meaning the following. For representation, representation pi of G, uh, pi is P distinguished, uh, if and only if data pi is Q distinguished. I mean, if, if, if you have a statement like that, I, I say P and Q are, are related by data correspondence. Now, in this case, you can consider the relative character for pi, uh, you know, ref with respect to the period p, and one, uh, you know, the, the q relative character for theta pi, and you can then ask whether they are related. So this question was specialized to these group cases, right? It was exactly the same question that we had uh, addressed earlier. So, uh, so here are some examples, okay, of periods which are related. Uh, and some of these have been covered in Yanni's talk uh, on the first day. So for example, these are these rank one examples. On mod On minus one, G2 mod SL3, F4 mod spin nine. Uh, they are rank one examples because they are related to this, uh, you know, he was talking about relation with Kuznetsov, right? So the Whittaker uh, space, so to speak, Whittaker type uh, variety. So they are all related to this SL2 N mod N psi or their variants, okay? And in fact, uh, via data correspondence, okay, where the, the dual pair are SL2ON in the first example. So I guess here it will be MP2G2 in, uh, I guess this will be MP14. And the last case is PGL2F4 in E7. So, so here are some rank two examples. So in this rank two examples, for example, E6 on F4, uh, they are all related to the Whitaker variety for SL3. Okay. Uh, and, well, how, uh, how or by data correspondence, you have SL3 cross the, the bigger group here, like SL6 or E6, okay? This is my age. Uh, another rank two example that doesn't belong to this family uh, was treated in my student's thesis. Uh, this is for the spherical variety SO5 mod U2. Uh, in this case, it is related to the following. Uh, it's rank two because the product of two rank ones, right? the Whittaker variety for PGL2 and the torus period for PGL2. The data correspondence here is between SO5 and PGL2 cross PGL2, okay? But with SO5 interpreted as PGSP4 and PGL2 cross PGL2 interpreted as PGSO4. Okay. Here's a nice rank three example, spin eight or uh, spin eight mod G2 is rank three because it's related to three copies of the Whittaker variety. You have this dual pair, SL2 cube cross spin eight in E7. We tech, I have a question about uh, the second one that you just did. Yeah. The rank two examples. So, I mean, everything that's generic is going to be um, 
distinguished by n theta, right? So uh, not yes, a, not everything is distinguished. For example, by in the SL three E case. Yes. Um, I, I mean, so what? I'm, I'm it is simply thinking. because uh, when you do data correspondence. Uh, yeah. So roughly speaking, data correspondence say give an injection from irreducible representation of SL3 to irreducible representation of H. H could be E6 here, right? But of course, nobody say this is subjective. In fact, it, it cannot possibly be, right? Because E6 is so much bigger than SL3. So what you are going to, yeah. Okay, so in the first case, the, the image ends up being exactly the things that are distinguished? That's right. That's right. Oh, that's neat. Okay, thank you. That's right. Um, okay. Yes. So uh, I'm going to just uh, finish up by looking at this example O n mod O n minus one because uh, so that this case was treated in detail in a paper of mine with uh, my student Charlie one uh, that appeared maybe just appeared in the proceedings of the Simon Symposium uh, from 2018 or something like that. So here I'll take V to be a speed quadratic space of sufficiently large dimension. I fix a unit vector, assume that there's a unit vector. Okay? Otherwise, just rescale your form. Uh, V0, so I, I have an orthogonal decomposition. So I have this OU containing OV. And I'm looking at a symmetric space, OV over OU, which uh, is either a sphere or a hyperboloid, depending on whether the, you know, you're in a compact case or not. And uh, so we mentioned, this, so this was the, one of these rank one examples, right? And we mentioned that it's related to the Whittaker variety, SL2 by N side. Okay, now in fact, let's make this statement more concrete. What, what does related mean, right? So you can, you can, uh, you can look at this uh, from two different view angles. So one is from the smooth setting, smooth representation theory, or the L2 representation theory. So in a smooth setting, what you have was, uh, you know, if sigma is tempered representation of SL2 and pi is the data leaf of sigma, then uh, there's an isomorphism of these two home space. Okay, on the right hand side is the Whittaker space of Whittaker functionals. The left hand side is the OU period. So you see that you know, like for example, pi is OU distinguished if and only if its data leaf is generic. Okay. Uh, in the L two setting, this relation between the two, uh, you know, these two varieties is manifested in the following way. Uh, consider the functional decomposition of uh, you know L two or SL two mod n side. Uh, you know, it breaks out in some way, okay? So in fact, we know that it, it is, uh, it is, you know, the measure is the punctual measure. And uh, but what is better than the regular representation is that you, the multiplicity is not infinite. The multiplicity is at most one, because here you take the, this space is either zero or one dimensional. So it's supported on side generic uh, tempered representations. So, so if you write it in this way, then L2 of OV mod OU it's just inherited from the expression above by putting, inserting this data right here. So this is a, another uh, manifestation of the relation between these two, uh, you know, these, these two varieties. Okay, now, uh, now I want to uh, quickly, maybe one minute, recall uh, Bernstein's uh, interpretation of a direct integral decomposition like what we just saw at the end, okay? To give such a direct integral decomposition, according to Bernstein, is to give uh, one of the following two equivalent data set of data. Okay, maybe the second one is easier to describe. Uh, so let me do that first. Uh, it is basically to say that you know you you have two functions on here. You take their inner product SL two mod n, okay, and you are trying to give a spectral decomposition of the inner product. Okay. Now the the first one is to say that you know to give uh, some pro equivalent projection map. Okay, so if you give you a family of such map indexed by sigma, you can dualize it, right? When you dualize it, you get map from a sigma check to C infinity of this thing, right? But of course, sigma is unitary, so sigma check is sigma bar, okay? Uh, so it's to give such data so that you have a pointwise uh, spectral decomposition, okay? These are just two different, uh, different ways of uh, effecting a direct integral decomposition. So, and, and the reason for introducing that is because I want to talk about this map alpha beta. Uh, I want to talk about what a uh, relative character is. Okay, and uh, so of course relative character is like a character. You can write down a formula in terms of some autonomous basis and you have this sum of matrix coefficients, right? But, but here's uh, two other ways of interpreting it. 
One is to say that it is just this uh, inner product J sigma that appears in the spectral decomposition. Okay? But it is a, uh, oh yeah, so I say that the, these two notions, okay, because on the previous slide I have two uh, interpretation of this direct integral. One is this J, okay, one is alpha, and they are related in this way. Okay? So one notion of relative, uh, one way of introducing relative character is to say that it's just this J sigma. But you can sort of play around with it. You can re recast it in this way. It is a linear function on SL2 mod n psi, which is n psi invariant. I mean, so, so n psi x on the right here. Okay? And, and in fact, it is defined by this alpha beta f, beta alpha f, even at that one. So beta alpha f, if you recall, you go at the previous slide, right? Is, is that you have this point-wise spectral decomposition and the beta alpha f is just the, uh, the, 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 the sigma part, okay? Sigma, uh, oh, okay. So anyhow, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, use the relative character in this way, okay? Now, because we have also, uh, you know, the one for, for this, hyperboloid, we also have the relative character on beta sigma. And now we want to, uh, we want to prove a relative character identity, right? And so the question is you know, whether these two relative characters can be related. Uh, it's the same question as the one that I treated before, okay? And, and then, so for that, we need a transfer of functions. And here is this uh, familiar diagram, except now it looks a bit different. So we have number two maps P's and Q's, okay? So P goes to this Whitaker space, Q goes to, uh, so what is X? X is the orbit of V0, uh, which is OV mod OU. Okay. So this map here is just, uh, so this is the very representation, by the way. This, this omega is the very representation of SL2 cross OV. It's realized as functions of V. And this map here is just restriction map. Okay, so Q is just a restriction map because uh, th this is like a, a hyperboloid, um, you know, of norm one elements. Uh, P is this way, okay? So this looks very similar to before, right? Previously I had G5 equal to zero, okay? So now I look at G5 equal to this V0, this norm one elements are fixed. I denote the image by this S. So these functions contains completely supported functions, but they are larger, but they are contained in the harris chandra Schwartz space, okay? So that's the property here. Uh, I want to recall that, um, Yes, that this space is squeezed between Harris Chandra Swartz space in, uh, in the Whitaker setting and uh, CC infinity. Okay. So, another property is this Q induces isomorphism from the n side co-invariant to Sx. Okay, and uh, as mentioned in Yanni's talk, he actually defined this transfer. So, once we have this diagram, we can talk about transfer map uh, like before. And uh, in fact, this transfer map was defined by Yanis for every uh, rank one spherical variety. Okay, and now um, I think now uh, let me quickly uh, just run through this that now that you have this transfer, uh, as it's just a correspondence, but as before, if you pass through some co-invariant space, it becomes a well-defined map that allows you to pull back the relative character in the Whitaker setting to, to the X, okay? And then the theorem is that you just pull back to what you want it to be. So this, that's the correct relative character identity. Um, so in this case, we can actually write down um, the formula, okay? For some reason, because it's rank one, so it's just, there's only one variable. So, um, um, you know, so, so I, I'm gonna think of this phase of functions as functions on like OV mod OU on one side and mod OU on the other side. And here, SL2 mod N side and mod N side on the other side. And, and then here I'm telling you that, you know, on some open set, right? You, you can be identified with open subsets of the fi line, okay? Either f cross or f minus plus minus one. So my my orbital integrals are on these two spaces, and the relation is uh, you can be worked out, okay? It's given by some sort of some sort of Fourier transform like that. And this agrees with the formula in the uh, Yanis's paper, okay? And the the my last slide I think is that uh, in fact you can give a moment map interpretation. Uh, because, you know, we have our familiar moment map here. And what I've done here is I have mapped it further down to N, because N is a sub-algebra of SPW. So I guess there's a star here. So uh, there's a restriction map from SPW star to N star. Call it B. Likewise here, I have a map from SOV to SOU star. 
And I take the element zero in SOU because I'm looking at a trivial character on OU. I take an element E, a non-zero element in here because it corresponds to a Whittaker functional. I take the pre-image under B and D that has an action of uh, N and SOU and I quotient that away. So this is a, this our construction is called a symplectic reduction, right? And then uh, this moment map uh, picture uh, give me an identification of these two symplectic reduction. And as you can see, this is kind of on level of Lie algebra. And so it's an infinitesimal version of this correspondence here. And this is how, uh, in general, classes here, it transfer the classes there through this, uh, through this identification at an infinitesimal uh, level. OK, so I think that uh, that's all. And uh, that's, where we really, that's where we really want to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ritaik. Are there any questions? Uh, it is a very obvious question that uh, one would uh, like to ask. You know, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, relationship between SO2 and plus one. Uh, the two inner forms and MP2N. Uh, yes. After having fixed an additive character. Yes. So the question is whether uh, the two groups on the two sides, uh, uh, whether uh, nilpotent orbits can be matched and whether semi-simple orbits also can be matched. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the semi-simple orbits, I guess you can just do by eigenvalues. And it's basically given by this moment map, uh, at least on the level of Lie algebra. Over, over a given base field, you can match the... Yeah, I think so, yes, I think so. So, um, at, at least, you know, I mean, I don't know about every conjugacy class, but at least for some sufficiently many conjugacy classes, uh, open dense set of uh, like regular semi-simple elements, for example. I was having some difficulty with the nilpotent orbits. You know, I was just running this argument in my mind that uh, maybe the number of nilpotent orbits, you know, in the simplest case of MP2 is, uh, uh, so to say, F star mod F star square. And yes. that is where the additive character psi will play a role. Yes. Whereas for SO3, it is unique and there is on the compact SO3, the region. Yes. So I was wondering whether the additive character, which must play a role. Yes, uh, it plays a role. It plays a role because it plays a role in the the Shimura correspond. I mean, the local Shimura correspondence. Of course, is subordinate to uh, the fixing such a choice, and the yes. the whole theory of transfer is you know is effected through the very representation. So, so so the choice is there. Yeah. If you change no, that, you, you get a different version. Group theory might play a role even in group theory. Uh, yeah, that I, I don't uh, really know. So I was just wondering that. whether the nilpotent orbits could be matched so that the germ expansions could be matched. Um, yeah, so I, I, did, I didn't pursue this uh, uh, direction, meaning, you know, for me, I just treat this character as this conjugacy invariant function on an appropriate space of test function. So I didn't uh, dig into the you know, the more intricate uh, things of like character expansion. But, but if you interpret this uh, in a character expansion, the new potent, um, the leading new potent orbits in terms of uh, uh, this uh, Gelfand drive, generalized Gelfand drive uh, characters, then, then yes, you, can, you know, data correspondence, you can, uh, you can relate that. So, so you have uh, match you have matched the formal yeah, so yeah so so now 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 i remember so th there is this work of uh, raul gomez uh, and uh, Chen Zhu, okay that does the following for the uh, for a dual pair using the moment map they define a correspondence of a map of new potent orbits from one to the other this is general not just equal rank okay and 
Of course, sometimes it will be sent to zero, okay? Uh, sent to, sent to not, I mean, well, it's a correspondence, let's say, okay? It's not defined on some elements have no image. And, and then, so they define using a moment map, uh, a, a matching of new potent orbits. And then they prove that under the data correspondence, so, so let's say your orbit X corresponds to an orbit Y, right? On the other side. X and Y give you this uh, generalized Gelfand drive models. And they prove that uh, the Gelfand drive model of pi corresponding to X is basically identified or isomorphic to uh, as a vector space to the uh, to the Gelfand graph model of theta pi corresponding to y. So, the, so this result is uh, um, maybe is of the type, the nature you're asking. Yeah, and I want to say also that of course uh, for this MPW MP2n SO2 n plus one, there's a theory of endoscopy that one way had when Wei Li had developed in his thesis, which he talked about in the first day, I mean, the first talk of this conference. And so since you have this, you have a notion of endoscopic character identities, right? And you have a notion of endoscopic transfer, which he also proved. And then there's a notion of endoscopic character identities. So for the L packets of MPW defined using the local Shimura correspondence, um, uh, I guess my, student, my former student Chai Hua Luo had in his thesis verified that those packets satisfy the endoscopic character identities. Now, I don't know what's the relation between the endoscopic character identities and this one, because this one is, uh, you know, data correspondence is not just a transfer of packets. Your language functionality only relates packets to packets, right? But, but data correspondence seems to be some sort of refinement where you can take one guy in a packet and match it to another guy in a packet. And, 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 and this sort of relates their character in some way, but um, I don't know the relation to, of this to, to, to endoscopic character identities. Good, good, thank you. Uh, Witek, can you extend this argument for the dual pairs beyond the classical case of equal rank when tempered are moved to tempered? Uh, you see, I had that uh, slide that I spent a long time on, right? Called the, the former setup. Okay. Yes. So you can have that big commutative diagram. Okay. This one's for free. So you, you have that. And then now the point lies in whether you can give meaningful interpretation to some of the terms, especially those two co-invariant space and the arrow they have. Okay. And, and in order to do that, you need some, you need some inputs to be, to hold for you to be able to have this interpretation. And, uh, I mean, I would say that to some extent, the answer is yes, but in the end, it depends on how well you understand the exceptional data correspondence. You know, like you need to know how duality, but you know, how duality is not proved in any uh, sort of general setting for exceptional dual pairs, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so you can do that, but, but I want to say that, you know, and there's one other point about this commutative diagram, which is even you put yourself in this how duality thing, right? So that you, a lot of spaces are one dimension. Then it is clear that this diagram commutes up to scalars, mm -hmm. okay? And then now you want to pin down the scalars. Um, you know, that's, the, that's something extra you have to do. And it comes down to, you know, like even you have a one dimension space of map data from omega to pi tensor sigma. That was my initial data, right? My very simple initial data. Even if you know that this space is one dimensional, which multiple you know, of data do you want to, to, to put into this diagram? Okay, because, um, yeah, so, 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 because, you know, imagine you fix hard measure and you fix everything. So, so the other things are all fixed already. Mm -hmm. And you know that you take a uh, data, it, it, um, it will, both sides will commute up to scalars. Okay? I mean, you have two sides to this target, right? And you can say that, let me choose the appropriate multiple so that this side commutes. But then you must make sure, I mean, then the other side, you have to check that it commutes as well. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and so, so some, some compatibility need to hold. And, and so where is this normalization coming from? So is there a magical normalization that makes everything commute? And, and the answer is yes, right? That's part of the contents. And, and where is it coming from? Answer, it, it is coming from the L2 theory. When you have this uh, L2 spectral decomposition of, for example, the Bay representation is a representation of G cross H. You, when you write down this direct integral, you are providing some normalization of this 
maps alpha uh, that appear in Bernstein's uh, interpretation. I mean, that alpha is the data in the, in the first case I talk about. I see. Okay, thank you. I have a naive question. Is yeah. in this case the full theta irreducible? Uh, let me see. Yes, for tempered. Uh, for tempered. Yeah, but I only restrict tempered, right? So all my stories about tempered representations. So in the equal rank case, tempered representation, the big data is irreducible. 